So, uh, let's see, I, um, uh, there were a few more things I could have said about uh, the alloys, uh, and I will uh, talk about them perhaps two or three classes down the line uh, uh, when we start talking a little bit more detail about uh, growth uh, and uh, epitaxy. I, I have already kind of started uh, discussing that a little bit uh, 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 in the a um, few of the earlier classes, but uh, we'll spend um, maybe two, two or three lectures uh, focusing on MBE and a couple of lectures focusing on CVD processes as well in, 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 in the later part. Uh, what I want to talk now, uh, talk about now uh, is, is uh, 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 actually one of the um, um, very important uh, things about uh, not just compound semiconductors, but all semiconductors, which is uh, uh, defects. Uh, and uh, what uh, I think we also uh, understand that uh, uh, defects are, uh, you know, um, from the name it sounds that it's not good. It's uh, something that's to be avoided. But uh, 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 in reality, this is something that you cannot uh, do anything without uh, in, in a semiconductor device. You, you have to, uh, 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 I think the uh, common saying is uh, that uh, a perfect uh, semiconductor crystal uh, exists uh, only in one place and that is in the books, right? So there is no such thing as a perfect uh, crystal. Uh, there are always defects. And uh, the success of semiconductors uh, is uh, really because of uh, two reasons. One is uh, you can perfect its crystallinity, but that's not enough. Uh, uh, you can make, uh, basically, uh, even in theory, if you could make a perfect semiconductor crystal, it's not useful as a device. For a device, you really need to control defects. What, what we mean is doping uh, uh, and control conductivity, uh, control where the Fermi level is, etc. Right. So, so that that part we understand, and therefore uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 science of defects is uh, uh, as interesting as the science of the perfect semiconductor. Uh, and uh, in a certain sense, uh, if you start looking at applications, uh, we are at a stage where the uh, perfect semiconductor crystal properties are reasonably well understood. But the defect properties, there's still a lot to be done. So, so, and and uh, uh, what we also have found uh, over the last, uh, you know, uh, half a century of work on semiconductors is uh, pretty much every property you can find that is controllable in a defect uh, is useful. You can find a use for it. You know? so, so, essentially, let's put it that way. Uh, it may hurt you in some devices, but you can turn it around and make a device that will make use of the property. So, so from that perspective. Uh, defects are extremely important, and uh, we'll we'll uh, discuss this uh, 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 discuss its pro uh, the properties of various defects in in uh, uh, semiconductors, and and uh, I will try to um, highlight what is different in compound semiconductors uh, compared to elemental uh, semiconductors such as silicon or germanium and and, and things like that. Uh, uh, okay, so and this is in chapter seven in your book, and uh, there are a few more. Uh, references or articles I'll post on the website so you can also read them. Okay, so, yeah. uh, okay, so uh, what we'll start with is, is uh, uh, looking at uh, kind of a variety of, of uh, w what are the various defects that can occur uh, in a semiconductor. Right? That's the question we want to start with and then start looking at, uh, so we'll kind of classify in some sense the defects uh, that can occur in a semiconductor. And then we will, uh, today uh, what we'll do is uh, look at two things. Uh, one is uh, uh, what is the uh, probability of uh, formation of those defects. Uh, and, and that is uh, uh, related very much to uh, uh, some of the methods we developed earlier. The way we are going to look at it is competition always between uh, order and energy and disorder and entropy. So we'll see that that will give us what is the probability of formation of defects. And what we'll see is uh, uh, because we are with most of the semiconductors, ult ultimately we are interested in electronic properties or photonic properties. The uh, one thing that enters uh, this uh, defect statistics uh, uh, is, is, is the property of, I mean, the charge state of these defects. It's very important. And we'll see that uh, uh, sometimes the, the, uh, that will forbid you from getting, uh, say, p-type doping in a wide band gap. For example, you know, I mean, uh, for some semiconductors, it will kind of make it very hard for you to get there and, and things like that. Yeah. And then the understanding that is uh, extremely important because uh, 
you know, you, 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 you can, one can say that, well, if you want p-type doping in, say, gallium arsenide or gallium nitride, just choose, you know, replace the gallium atom with something that has one less electron and you get a p-type. But whether it's energetically favorable and, and such things, that's the question we are starting to, uh, uh, you know, uh, think about right now. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, defects, uh, I think we all, uh, uh, have, uh, we probably have seen uh, uh, in, in various courses uh, 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 how, what, what are the various kinds of defects that can occur. So I, we can start with a, with a, a crystal lattice, and uh, uh, and and you know, let's say we, for simplicity, we start with uh, uh, just silicon uh, or an elemental semiconductor. And then we'll that you know uh, by looking at the defects in an elemental semiconductor, we will uh, immediately it will immediately point to the existence of new kinds of defects that are not present in elemental semiconductors that are inherent to compound semiconductors. Okay, so we'll start with elemental semiconductor, uh, which is let's say silicon. So each lattice site here uh, uh, is supposed to be uh, uh, silicon, right? So every lattice site is silicon, right? and uh, if every lattice site in the whole crystal is silicon. Uh, then uh, where are the defects? Uh, the claim is there are still defects, but where are they? You know, in, a, in, a, in a semiconductor wafer, for example, if every atom is in its right place, then where are the defects? There are still defects. Yeah, so they're on the surface, right? So, so on the surface, now you have broken bonds and uh, interface states and, 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 and such. So they, they uh, uh, in fact, uh, figuring out how to control the surface states and interface uh, Surface and interface states were uh, absolutely key to making the silicon transistor work. You know, the MOSFET of any field effect device, you have to get uh, electric field through the surface, and uh, any defect states or trap states that uh, can uh, essentially capture your charges and terminate your electric fields will not let you make a transistor. So that was the first thing. But let's look at the bulk properties right now. Uh, we are not going to look at the surface. So you can see right away any finite crystal has defects already, even if all the atoms are in the right place. Right? So, yeah. But now we are going to look deeper inside the bulk and now ask uh, that uh, what are the... Uh, now if every atom is uh, 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 silicon, then there, are, then there are no defects. Uh, and what we'll show uh, today is, is that is thermodynamically impossible. You know? So, so you, you cannot have, uh, you know, um, all atoms of the... Uh, you will always have a finite number of uh, 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 defects, and, and that's where we're getting towards. Okay. So what are the possible defects? So uh, every atom is silicon here, and uh, uh, let's just do that, start with that, okay? Uh, what are the possible defects one can create? And there's nothing very fancy about this. You can... Uh, uh, you know, just intuitively uh, or heuristically figure out what, what should be the defects. Okay. And then we'll see that it will immediately lead to a classification of uh, defects based on a few things. Okay. Uh, and we will do that now, but let's, let's say, so, so all, everything is silicon and this, there are no defects in this right now, right? But uh, how can you introduce defects? Let's say, what, yeah. Yeah, pull out a silicon atom. Okay, that's that's a good point. So let's say this atom is missing, right? So that would obviously be called a vacancy, right? It's a missing atom. Uh, so that's a vacancy. Uh, uh, and uh, so let's write that down. Uh, so what we are going to first look at, vacancy will be classified as a point defect. All right, so this is from the, uh, from the consideration of, of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I think you can see it. You know, the 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 the, the defect is at least uh, from the point of view of a nucleus of the atom. There's only one point where it's missing, right? Uh, where the silicon. But electronically, it's not really a point defect. There are you know repercussions that happen because of missing atom here. The electronic wave function can actually propagate and and. Various parts of the crystal can see that point defect, right? And, and so we are not looking at that aspect. We're just saying these are point defects, or in other words, you can call it uh, a zero-dimensional defect, right? Zero-dimensional defect. Right? So, uh, so uh, we are going to say uh, so vacancies, right? And uh, um, <clears throat> what else? So yeah atom is missing, that's a vacancy. So you can have, uh, yeah, maybe I think it's not very hard to imagine. Is the, some other atom 
Uh, some other atom here? Uh, okay, so uh, for example, one can say that this atom could have, uh, instead of being there, it could have been here, right? The silicon atom itself, right? And so what would that be called generally? It's an interstitial, right? So that's, right? Uh, all right, vacancies, interstitials. Uh, Okay, what else? If you pull out an atom and put it in the, in the gap, that's affected. Very good. So that's right. So, so let's say, uh, you know, I pull this atom out and I put it close to this as that it's not completely independent of each other. We don't put it far out. So this is actually a pair, right? It's just like an electron hole pair, which is called an exciton. So uh, this is a pair. Uh, so this is called a Frankel pair, right? Uh, after the physicist who Frankel uh, pair, right? Uh, and if the atom, the the, the the interstitial atom stays close to this, right? You know, within a uh, interacting length, that's called a Frankel pair. But sometimes this atom can basically float out all the way to the surface because of whatever reasons. That would be a Schottky pair. You know, that, that's called a Schottky pair, for example. Uh, uh, <coughs> so it basically, here what, this, uh, the atom has floated to the surface, and there's a vacancy somewhere deep inside. You know? So it's very far out. But maybe there's some weak interaction. Maybe not. But uh, that would be a Frankel pair here. And uh, uh, sorry, Frankel pair is like an exciton. And, uh, okay. Uh, what else? Is this all? Or maybe this is all. Right. So, very good. So now, yeah. Right. right. So, so these are, as you can see, these are intrinsic. Right? Meaning, if I have silicon, I have the most perfect environment. I have no other chemical impurity at all. No other atoms at all. These are intrinsic defects. Right? Meaning, just silicon will do it. Right? I mean, don't need any other impurity, uh, any other uh, for an atom here. So these, you can call them as intrinsic. And what we'll see later today is uh, thermodynamics uh, or energetics says that no matter how hard you make your, how clean you make a material, you will always have a few of these. So that, that's what thermodynamics will say, you know, the intrinsic ones, no matter how, how elementally clean you are, right? These, these will be there. Okay. Uh, now, uh, before we go to uh, you know, uh, adding extra atoms. Let's look at the same problem, but now we look at a compound semiconductor. The compound semiconductor now is is uh, let's say you know uh, gallium arsenide, so gallium arsenic. Uh, right, so let's start with that. Slightly lightly shaded here, right? So the, every alternate atom is is, is uh, uh, gallium and the, uh, the other is arsenic, right? So, so all right, so what, what do you see, uh, uh, sorry, do you see any, any further sort of defects that can occur? So it's an alternating lattice, right? So if it, let's say this is gallium and this is arsenic. So all that we talked about are going to be there, right? But there'll be more, right? What, what are the more things that can happen here? For example, so, yeah. That's right. So they can switch spots, right? Uh, get, uh, you know, instead of being this perfect uh, periodic uh, alternate lattice, you can have these two switch spots. Right? So there can be a gallium here, and this cannot happen in silicon, in an elemental. So this is native some sense to compound semiconductors. So that would be called an anti-site, you know? Anti-site where instead of, uh, uh, in, instead of uh, the arsenic here, what you have is maybe a gallium atom sitting here and maybe an arsenic sitting there. So, so, so that, uh, you know, uh, so you, if you have, you would call the arsenic in a gallium site and there you'd call a gallium in the arsenic site. So the an anti-site defect. Yeah, another one. So these are elemental plus compound semiconductors, right? So 
but these are now only compound semiconductors. Right, so we have an anti-site uh, defects. Uh, well, I, I think it's clear what it is. We just talked about that. Right? What else? Right. So I think you can see also all these things that we talked about become two, two, two times. Everything can be two, you know, two or four times. I mean, if you have involving two, you can have four varieties and all that now, right? So, so they kind of proliferate right away. So each of them becomes, you know, you can have a gallium vacancy, you can have a arsenic vacancy, similarly gallium interstitial, arsenic interstitial, right? Uh, you know, okay, so, and then, and, and Frankel pair, you know, the gallium atom could have moved out and left a vacancy, or the arsenic atom could have moved out, left a vacancy, and all that sort of thing, right? So, so you kind of have a proliferation, in some sense, of possible defects here. Does it make sense? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why compound semiconductors are harder to kind of uh, grow and control defect of, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's hard, you know, because you have more possibilities. You know. And if you have more possibilities, some of them are thermodynamically allowed. Uh, all of them are thermodynamically allowed, but uh, uh, one has to be a little more careful when you are creating the crystal to avoid, if you want to avoid the defects, to avoid them. Okay. So uh, that, that kind of, uh, uh, one can maybe potentially think of more, but that's roughly a range of things one can do with defects here, with point defects, right? Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, so, um, and these are all intrinsic, right? You don't need any additional foreign atom or any impurity, external impurity to cause this, right? and that's important, right? uh, Okay, so now if we open the window to uh, external impurities, right? So impurities uh, uh, can be uh, we can think back about silicon, so now again, the impurities can go in various places now, right? The impurity can be substitutional, right? It can uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, bigger, I don't know. So it could be substitutional, or it could be interstitial, right? Uh, uh, and uh, so for the elemental semiconductor, now it's clear that a substitutional impurity can be only of one, meaning it, 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 it can be only of one kind. It can substitute one atom, and it looks the same as the rest, right? But in a compound semiconductor, now it has two spots to go to, right? So uh, you can substitute uh, uh, group three site or group five site, or you know if you have any compound. So, so with the same atom, you can, you can do that, right? So. So, so you have substitutional impurities uh, uh, of that kind. Uh, so these are clearly extrinsic now. These are extrinsic uh, uh, or uh, and and uh, um, uh, okay. So so uh, and and then uh, we are kind of obviously uh, talking about them as separate defects, and 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 then that's all right. So so. Uh, these are all point defects then, right? Substitutional impurities uh, um, can, and we are not yet talking about what are the electronic properties, just the material, you know, the atom, where, where is it? And that's all we're talking about right now. Right? So. Now you can classify them, each of these now, uh, based on various other things which have to do with symmetry uh, of the wave function that it might, you know, uh, be inside. But one of the very important things we'll look at very soon today is charge. Where, where is the electronic state? In the band gap, because that is very uh, that completely controls electronic and photonic properties in the end of this device of, of, the, of the semiconductors. Right? So where, where does the energy fall in the band structure so, so of these defects? Right. So uh, here's a very uh, uh, you know uh, um, is representation of, of some of these defects we just talked about. Uh, uh, so gallium uh, vacancy. So this light, you know, the gray. Uh, circles are gallium, so vacancy for gallium, uh, interstitial arsenic, right, and uh, uh, antisite, arsenic antisite, right, and uh, carbon substitutional dopant, right, in the arsenic site, and so on. So, so there are a few, few, few examples, right, in 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 the crystal. Um, 
Okay, so what we are going to uh, do next uh, is, is look at, uh, for, for example, you can, uh, one of the things you, you, we, we have even within this window, even within this, you know, if you start looking at uh, 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 interstitials, there are some, some further details. If I, if I particularly look at interstitials, what you'll realize if you look carefully at this structure is not every site, interstitial site, is the same. So it's very interesting in a compound semiconductor. Uh, not every interstitial site will be the same. Right? And for, for example, what you, so, so uh, let's look at a standard uh, lattice for these structures is FCC, right? Uh, for silicon or, or gallium arsenide is a, a zinc blend sort of lattice. And uh, the FCC lattice will, uh, you know, okay, let me just sketch it. So, and then we try to uh, figure out whether uh, we can explain why not all interstitial sites are the same. So, so there, there can be multiple interstitial sites which are uh, inequivalent and have uh, different. Uh, uh, okay, so so uh, the FCC uh, will uh, uh, look like well, the, uh, the center of every face. Oh, what am I doing? That's, that's not a good <laughs> cube. Something like that, right? So, uh, so, so the center of every face, uh, there is a lattice point, right? That's that's what FCC is is about. Uh, so, the bottom face, this side, that side, let's say, and and uh, I think you know that, uh, 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 for example, uh, you can connect uh, these points. Uh, that kind of goes that way to the face centers. And then you can create a, a tetrahedron out of that, right? So, and there is a open space in between inside there. So that's a tetrahedral interstitial site, for example. Uh, I'm not drawing the the next, but actually, if you go to the next one, and what you'll realize if you take a, a slightly different uh, a combination, which is you know the face centers of these nearest neighbors uh, cells here, you can create an octahedral site out of them. So, and then you can have a atom sitting, or, or you can actually create it right here, you know, by connecting these three and then another one, and you can have a impurity interstitial site here, which is octahedral. Around it, the atoms are arranged octahedral. It's not the same. So the chemical environment, is, oh, what I mean, so I actually have this. Yeah, so this is from, uh, so here, here's the tetrahedral, uh, vacancy, oh, sorry, interstitial site, and here's a octahedral interstitial site, and they are uh, not identical. So, so the electronic properties are different. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, okay, so, so you know, you, you can have various possibilities now of, 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 the, of, of, of this sort of uh, picture. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, if you just look at the lattice points, uh, if you consider the, uh, uh, you know, say silicon. Or if you consider gallium arsenide, let's say as an example, uh, gallium arsenide uh, to create the whole crystal. Uh, remember, FCC is the lattice; it's not the you know crystal. Crystal has lattice plus basis, right? In a gallium arsenide uh, crystal, uh, the lattice point is FCC, but the basis has a gallium, and let's say this is the arsenic. Let's say, right? So uh, gallium arsenide has arsenic atoms only in the tetrahedral sites, not in the octahedral sites. Very interesting. I mean, you can think of the gallium arsenide crystal as a crystal which has uh, the basis is such that the gallium atoms are at every FCC lattice point, right? But only the tetrahedral point, lattice points, tetrahedral interstitial points have arsenic in it. You know? It's not a vacancy. It's not interstitial, but I mean, you can think of it that way. So, the ones in tetrahedral, this, these are missing. So you can think of it that way, uh, but but we are talking about a vacancy. So so uh, clearly in gallium arsenide, you know this this is not you, you know this is uh, unavailable for you to fill interstitials because it's arsenic already. Does that make sense? And you can fill octahedral sites. Right? So it's nothing there. So you can put stuff in there, and then for example this this you know this this little arsenic uh, 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 could have moved out from a tetrahedral site to an octahedral site as an interstitial. Uh, these are the geometries. Now, uh, obviously, uh, the, its its chemical surrounding affects a lot about its where, what is its energy, you know, what what are its capture cross sections and all that sort of thing that we are going to uh, look at uh, uh, 
uh, in the next uh, uh, couple of uh, uh, today. Okay, so we're going to start looking at today. Okay, so so the next uh, thing I wanted to uh, discuss is is uh, the the uh, um, <coughs> so that that's just the zero dimensional point defects, and later on I'll talk about higher dimensional defects. Right, so so you can have one dimensional defect in a right. What is a, an example of a one dimensional? Yeah, a dislocation, which is, a, you know, essentially, uh, you have this sort of a broken missing atom, but not just in one side, but the whole, you know, line of them. So, 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 for example, right? Uh, uh, and and there's little more to that. I mean, it's not just that. So so you can have edge and uh, screw dislocations in three dimensions, right? So uh, or you can have a line, you know, uh, instead of. Uh, um, so that's an example. We're going to discuss that in, in some detail uh, in the next class. Uh, so you can have, uh, what about uh, two-dimensional defects? So, so these are like grain boundaries uh, and interfaces. So, uh, and you can have three-dimensional defects where uh, essentially what you, you know, if you have a phase separation of something, you, you can think of it as a three-dimensional defect, or you have a cluster of gallium atoms somewhere instead of you know just one missing, and all, or instead of just a substitution, you have a big cluster which is gallium, too much more gallium. So, so these are all defined, as you can see, uh, uh, based on the uh, spatial extent or the geometry of locations of the defects. That's that's what is defined. Uh, right? Now, all these we talked about till now are are, are Specifically for three-dimensional crystals, right? Like uh, uh, diamond, silicon, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, right? But if you go to a 2D crystal like graphene or molysulfide, you will have similar things, but you have to think uh, there are some some you know very interesting differences to 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 this. For example, uh, in a two in a one di in a uh, you can think about it. You know, if you have a line defect. Uh, in a 2D crystal, what does what does that mean? Is it does it mean if I'm missing bonds along a whole line, that means it, is it two crystals or is it one crystal? You know, it's not, not not very clear now. Do you know what I mean? So so because it's a 2D crystal to start with, right? And what we'll see uh, when we talk about the extended defects later is uh, uh, there are you know some interesting consequences that are not present in 3D. For example, if you have a line defect, it will naturally cause ripples and all that in, in, a, in a 2D layer because that's how the energy can relax. Here, it cannot form ripples because it's surrounded. It's not free to move in, in any direction. So, so there are all these little nice uh, differences as you go to, uh, uh, go to the... Uh, so, so this is the defect dimensionality, but then there's the crystal dimensionality too, right? And beca because of them, you have various combinations of them right, that lead to a richer range of uh, observable phenomena. Okay, so let's look at uh, uh, the uh, the first thing we want. I want to do today is look at uh, um, the uh, one of the most uh, one of the defects or the, one of the defects that you really want to control very precisely, and that is substitutional impurities or doping, you know, where you want to control uh, the, the the doping very accurately. Uh, and and uh, what we'll see first is is. Uh, 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 let's look at again uh, a, a simpler, a simple example to start with. Uh, we did talk about doping some time ago, also in this class. Uh, you know that there are uh, various uh, ways you can uh, uh, dope a uh, semiconductor. So, so one can uh, actually uh, um, uh, let, let, let's look at the simplest model of of a dopant, a substitutional doping. Let's call it this way. So that would be clearly an extrinsic defect. It's not an intrinsic defect. Right? So, it's, so you intentionally introduce it, but sometimes it may be unintentional too. You know, you're growing it in a certain as clean an environment as you can, but you know uh, there are some uh, uh, impurity atoms that got into the crystal anyway. Right? So, so that that's that's uh, so you can have obviously. Uh, needless to say, you can have intentional doping or unintentional doping. 
And typically, if you read some papers, you will see this term UID. That means unintentionally doped. You, know, you couldn't avoid it. So, so UID is unintentionally doped. Right? So, uh, uh, but uh, let's look at uh, uh, what happens if you place the dopant atom uh, in, a, in a semiconductor crystal. Uh, uh, let me, before I go there, uh, why do we need this to control, uh, why do we need uh, doping is to control uh, the carrier concentrations. You know? Electron, make it electron rich, make it electron poor, or hole rich. Uh, as a consequence, you move the Fermi level right, inside the material from conduction band to valence band. Right? Uh, so that's a way to control conductivity and its type. Right? So both are extremely important, obviously, in the device. Uh, but the doping is not the only way to control conductivity. You can do those things by other means. What are the other means you can control the conductivity of a semiconductor crystal? If you want, uh, if, if I were to just picture it from the perspective of uh, uh, bands, right, I can have conduction band, valence band, and then what I'm saying is obviously doping is what allows you to move the Fermi level up or down, right? I can control it. But what I'm saying is this is not necessarily the only way. You can do it by other means too. What are the other means? So, yeah. Anybody? No? Nope. Sorry? Apply voltage. Apply voltage, right. So you can, that's field effect, right? You can use field effect, and that's the heart of every transistor, you know, the field effect transistor. So uh, you, you essentially, uh, in some regions, you dope it for contacts, but now you, you have a capacitor. Right, uh, you have a capacitive coupling to the Fermi level here, and you can move, uh, uh, move, uh, apply gate voltage. There's no charge transfer in, through the capacitor, but there's charge transfer to the contacts. Right, and and then you can, so you are actually doping it using electric fields, it's field induced doping. Right, so so that's a field effect. Right, in in any semiconductor. Right, any other means. Yeah. A good point. Strain uh, will move the Fermi level. It will, but uh, uh, I have to think a little bit. Probably not too much, but uh, it it will move it. But yeah, something easier than that. So, yeah. Uh, you can use polarization, and that's a good point. We we'll, uh, we have talked about that. We we don't. For example, for some some semiconductors, you can pull out mobile carriers from the bands. Uh, you, you have an infinite source, I mean, not infinite, a very large source of carriers in the buried bands here, a right? lot of electrons. So if you can pull out an electron, right, uh, by any means, uh, you get a hole and an electron. Right? So, so polarization fields can do that internally, right, and that's a very good point. You don't need substitutional doping. And uh, you can do that by another mean, right, you can shine light, right, then you can pull out electron and hole, but then you won't get you know, n type or p type, you will get, uh, you know, a, a exactly equal number of electrons and holes. You can modify that by creating heterostructures and that sort of thing. Pile up electrons there, holes there, and things like that. You can do that too, right? So, so there are other means, but we are now looking at chemical doping where we actually substitute the atom. So, but just be aware that uh, you can get around some some issues uh, uh, as long. So doping, what you'll see in the end in an electronic device is, is what helps you make contacts. That's really what it helps you make. The device doesn't require you to dope it, really. You know. so, so the device, the, the heart of the field effect transistor, if you don't dope it, it's okay. Right? But the contacts must be, you know, it's, and, and to be able to connect to the Fermi level. You know, so so that, that's okay. So uh, in, a, in an optical device, on the other hand, uh, this is uh, kind of critical to have enough carriers because uh, field effect transistors, all the action is near the surface of the device, right? So you can get a field effect. But in a buried device where you have, you know, quantum wells very deep inside an N-layer, P-layer, you can't have field effect there easily because there are a lot of free carriers in between. And so for them, doping is extremely important right? so for optical devices and LEDs and lasers. So. Okay, so uh, so let's look at substitutional doping. And uh, what we'll do is first, uh, uh, I have already talked about that if you can 
put in, say, you know, uh, ND uh, donors and or NA acceptors, uh, uh, then then uh, how do you find how many electrons you have? How many? How do you find how many holes you have? I'm not going to discuss that in any detail now, except uh, just write down that uh, how do you find if I dope a semiconductor with uh, uh, ND donors and NA acceptors at the same time. Uh, how do I find where's the Fermi level? So for that you go to charge neutrality, right? I mean that's the standard uh, thing that, that you say that well I'll have some electrons in the conduction band, some holes in the valence band, and then I'll have some ionized donors and I'll have some ionized acceptors, right? Right, and and basically the total negative charges, which is electrons in conduction band plus ionized acceptors, must be equal to the total positive charges, which will be like that, right? So, so, uh, and each of these terms depends on where is the Fermi level, right? So n depends on like n c e to the power something like that. If it's degenerate, if it's non-degenerate, if it's degenerate, you have to do a Fermi Dirac integral and that sort of thing. Okay. So, so I'm not writing that out, but that will uh, let you find where, w what is the, uh, you know, for example, at, at uh, various temperatures, is it n-type, is it p-type? and all that stuff. So, yeah. uh, one of the pictures that, uh, uh, I don't know whether I gave you in this course, but uh, uh, one of the pictures uh, that's very useful uh, in this, in this uh, uh, is, is basically you can say natural log of you know, each of these terms, okay, say n or p or all that, right? And then you plot it as a function of where is the Fermi energy, right? And uh, this can be the conduction band edge. This can, oh, sorry, valence band edge, and this can be the conduction band edge. Yeah. And uh, uh, when you plot them, uh, uh, each of them, so uh, as the Fermi level goes closer to the conduction band, the n increases, right? So what? Uh, basically, this picture, you know, will look uh, something, you know, at the n will look something like that. Then the other negative charge is n a minus, so that will look maybe something like that, right? And similarly, P would look something like that, and N A N uh, N D plus. If your material is doped uh, N type, then it will, you know, maybe look something like that. Let's say. And then we kind of, you know, uh, 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 take the sum of this and this, so you'll get, uh, right? So, so you'll get basically something that would be like that. You know, these are the negative charges, and the other, these are the positive charges, for example, and they look like that. And wherever they intersect, that's where the formula is. So, so that's a pictorial way of solving the problem. Right? So, have you? Did I give you an assignment on? I, I forgot about this. Okay, maybe maybe this is a good time to give you that problem. And what we what the reason I said this is because what we'll see now is exactly the same type of argument is is uh, uh, tells you um, what sort of uh, vacancies and interstitials will form or not form and all that. The same argument really. So essentially, uh, something about charge neutrality and energetics of this problem. So, uh, so, so typically in, in such a plot, you know, you will uh, have, uh, um, okay, I mean, there will be two flat regions, and there will be, one of them corresponds to ND, the other to NA, and, 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 and so on. Okay, so, uh, uh, but, but what I'm uh, interested in right now is, is uh, what is the activation, if I put in the dopant, let's say in gallium arsenide, uh, or silicon. Uh, let's talk about gallium arsenide. Uh, again, you, you probably have seen this derivation too. But uh, if I if I put in instead of uh, gallium, I substitute uh, it with uh, uh, say um, or in gallium nitride. Let's say I substitute it with silicon. Let's say silicon is group four and gallium is group three. And obviously, it has an extra electron, right? An extra electron, uh, uh, and therefore uh, uh, that electron could either be tied to, let's say, okay, so, so we put in a silicon in a gallium, let's say gallium nitride crystal. Right? Uh, so this was a gallium site. C clearly, as you can see, you have two choices: uh, silicon can go either into the gallium site or the nitrogen site, right? And uh, Actually, uh, energetically, it prefers to go to the gallium side uh, because that's where it can lower its energy and all that. Uh, but then that's not the only thing you can uh, uh, dope n type with. For example, uh, boron. All right, so I write that down again gallium, indium, 
uh, right, uh, and so on. So, uh, oh, sorry, I, I missed the group four. So, silicon, germanium, tin. Uh, so, so just looking at what sort of uh, dopants are we uh, interested in here? Uh, so, we are replacing, you know, the gallium atom with the silicon atom here, right? Uh, clearly, it's not in the same row, so the sizes are probably going to be slightly different of the atom itself. Now, uh, uh, regardless, so let's say uh, that the aspect of the size is something I'm going to just discuss in a, a couple of minutes. But uh, uh, first, let's look at uh, the, what is the end result that there is an extra electron, and uh, where will what will be the uh, so. The first things first is once you replace uh, an atom uh, in the whole crystal with only one atom, which is a foreign, uh, you know, which is a substitutional dopant. What happens to the band structure? The band structure. So, so uh, sorry, doesn't really change, right? Uh, but does it change? You know, so, you know, if you want to ask it exactly, okay, what happens to the band structure? Then, yeah. Right, so it will, you know, so essentially what has happened now is uh, really two things. One is you have uh, an, the whole crystal was charge neutral before, the whole crystal will be charge neutral even now. Right. As you brought in a, not a charged silicon atom, but a neutral charged silicon atom. So the whole crystal is still charge neutral, right? It's charge neutral, but it uh, does have an extra electron from the previous case where it, there was no dopant. It has an extra electron. Does that make sense? I mean, it's it's from here. It's not from this row. It has an extra extra uh, valence electron. I mean, outermost electron. Right. So, so uh, um, let me uh, first point this out that uh, the way to think about this problem now is is. Uh, uh, I can erase this part. <coughs> I will not uh, derive this in detail, but just point out uh, because this this consideration, uh, uh, if you remember the way we uh, calculated in this class at least the band structures were using this tight binding you know uh, matrices right and you diagonalize it you know you, you had this uh, ho you know uh, hopping elements and on site energies and all that right and, and now uh, uh, once you replace one of that, so, so that, that, that sort of a model is not really well suited. A tight binding model is very well suited for a perfect crystal, but it's not very well suited for taking care of a little fluctuation like this. It's not very well suited. You can, uh, 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 so uh, to take care of it exactly, but it can take care of it in a very nice way, uh, which is uh, called the effective mass theory, right? And, and from there you can take care of it. Uh, uh, so l l let me say there are two ways. Uh, the exact way is you have to solve the whole thing again. Right? So, but now you can see that uh, uh, you you have to basically diagnose a very big matrix, right? And 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 and, and that's that's uh, uh, so that's a very standard or very traditional problem with with a uh, dopant. There's you know if you have only ten. Uh, one in a ten to the power twenty two, you know you are you are trying to uh, search for. A very small thing in a very large uh, uh, matrix, and then clearly, it's very clear from the very beginning is that the whole band structure will remain pretty much the same. But uh, uh, what will happen is there will be some split off, um, some energy levels will split off from the bands, uh, and may enter the gap, may go somewhere else. You know, that's exactly what what will happen. The method that's uh, very well suited to answer that is is more based on uh, uh, this is. Uh, well, DFT does it in a reasonable way, but then there are analytical Green's function sort of approaches that do it also nicely. Uh, what I want to kind of point out is, is uh, uh, the let's say you have already solved the exact problem of the band structure uh, uh, for the perfect crystal with no dopants. Let's say, and you have found out your band structure. Right? Let's say, then you know that there are you have an EK diagram. Right, and then you have all these bands, right, and uh, you have uh, all these EK values, and Ks go run over from all over billion zones, 
minus pi by a to pi by a, and there, if you have n atoms, there are like n points in each band, and each of them can have spin up, spin down, and all that. So you have already found the entire uh, uh, you know, band structure, all the, all the eigenvalues, you found them. Okay. Now what you can do is you can uh, take uh, each of these eigenvalues and essentially uh, write down, this is just a you know, way of writing it down. Uh, you, uh, so you ch choose you know, K1, K2, and so on, M many points in the K space. And your matrix looks like this, K3, and so on. Right? That thing is equal to 0 is your equation of the band structure. All, all, you know, you have basically, the equation looks like E minus E of K1. E, this is after diagonalization, as you know, right? All the way, lots of terms is equal to 0. Therefore, you know, this can be this, this can be this, and all that sort of thing, right? So, but now what has happened is you have introduced a defect, and that defect level now is going to interact with some of these states. So what have you done? You have introduced an element which is an off-diagonal term here. Right. So, so, so it will, so let's say energy eigenvalue 1, 2, 3. So you'll have a, a you know, V2, 1, V1, 2, and so on. Some of, many of them can maybe 0, some of them maybe non 0, and so on. And then uh, now you resolve the problem. Right. So, so that, that's a way to think about this is the exact solution of, of a single defect. If you have multiple defects, as you can imagine, there's a very large matrix. Then you have a defect here, defect there, uh, and then essentially in the case space, maybe some of these elements would be, you know, because of other defects and all all that other thing. So I'm not getting into the details, but there's a very nice property here uh, of uh, uh, of these uh, matrices of this kind that uh, if all the elements are the same, you know, if all of them are the same, right, then what happens is something very interesting. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I can, I'm forgetting about the exact structure of the band for a second here, and say that, well, these are all the energies that were bunched up in the conduction band, bunched up energies in the valence band, and there's a gap. Right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, now, uh, if all the elements are the same, uh, what happens is, uh, this is a nice result from perturbation theory. So, uh, what happens is, if all the elements are negative, then the lowest energy, for example, uh, and, and it's interacting mostly with the conduction band, let's say it's a donor dopant, let's say. Then what happens is the lowest energy state here will, you know, uh, depending upon the value of the, str of the strength of this potential, is going to, you know, uh, let's say I'm going to plot the value or the strength of the potential. When the potential is zero, you don't have any dopants, and you have the original value. But uh, once you turn on the strength of the potential, what happens is this actually splits off, only the lowest one. Everything else is very slightly changed, you know, very slightly changed. But the lowest one splits off and goes deep. You know, and then this is really starts getting almost proportional to the potential. You know. So what happens is this is uh, essentially meaning you will be in a normal semiconductor, you'll be only at one point here. So what you'll have is you'll have a band, and then you'll have like one state here because of that one atom. So these are, uh, these are the, um, this is a way to think about deep levels typically, deep level uh, defects, you know, where, where the strength is very high. If the strength is very high, you cannot apply these perturbation or weak theories. You have to solve the whole problem, and this is how it's typically done at deep level. Uh, similarly, if that state is uh, positive instead of, and it's interacting with the conduction band, instead of the lowest one, the top one splits off. Uh, if it's interacting strongly with the valence band, it's negative, it, then you know, this one splits off, and so on. So, so it's only the top one that split off. And, and this is a very ni interesting property of the matrices of this uh, sort. Uh, and and uh, uh, in fact, it is also responsible for uh, explaining superconductivity and Cooper pairs, the same thing. And this is, comes from the same thing. Okay. But I'm, that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going any further into the details of this problem. So. Any questions? I think I've just briefly mentioned this. All right, so, if not, so what we'll do is the other approach, which is a much uh, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, it's a perturbative approach, which makes some sort of a presupposition that we are not uh, 
let's let me just first explain uh, what that is, uh, and this is called the hydrogenic model of a dopant. Uh, and and the idea is yes, your silicon came in; it has an extra electron compared to the and that uh, basically to form the chemical bonds. Uh, remember, it has replaced gallium, so it re only needed three electrons because there were you know five from the arsenic, so it only needed three to form the chemical bonds. But the one is left out, right? And that electron now, where is it? How far is it from this nucleus? What is its energy of that? What is the energy level of that? We don't know, and we want to find those. That's really what we want to do now, right? And so that electron now could be localized to a very small region around it, or it could be really delocalized, could be hovering around you know the whole, a lot, lot larger part of the crystal, right? And so on. And 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 the way th this is solved is uh, let's say uh, you have uh, already solved the problem. Uh, I mean, this is called the effective mass approach. Mm. Of uh, shallow dopants, and I'll just say uh, dopants. Uh, so essentially what it's saying is, let's say I found my band structure and I'm looking at only the bottom of the conduction band right, right here, and I can write my EK diagram of the conduction band as roughly you know, the conduction band at k is equal to zero, or the minima point, plus uh, eight square, you know, k square by two times the effective mass of the conduction band. That's you know, your potential energy and kinetic energy of the electrons, so the sum of the two energies is total energy. And uh, uh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to just outline this process, but uh, the end result is what I'm after, really. Uh, what you can show, and this was shown a uh, long time ago by Cohn, Walter Cohn and, and Luttinger, that uh, uh, y you can convert it into uh, you know, this effective mass uh, into real space through a Fourier uh, sort of analysis, Fourier series, where you, all, all you need to do is k, replace the k with minus i gradient. You know, that's what you need to do. All the k's. You, this is a k space energy. You want to go to real space energy because I want to kind of. The reason I'm doing that uh, is because I want to solve to answer the question: What is the radius of this electron? What is the energy? I have to solve the Schrodinger equation for it. It's an electron. It's a quantum mechanical particle, and I want to solve it in 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 real space. And so, uh, but this is the. How did you get this? You did the real, you know you took the Hamiltonian of the entire electron crystal, you solved it, and this is the band structure you got for the perfect crystal. And now we are saying that, okay, let me, let me just uh, uh, linearize it in around, or rather, let me, let me go to a region where the dopants will have the most effect, and then I want to go back to real space. And when you do that, what essentially ends up happening is your uh, conduction band uh, looks like EC of zero, um, and then this, you know, the Ks here get replaced by this, and you get a minus Okay, minus eight square by two times effective mass of the conduction band, and you get a del squared. So that's how that's what happens to your EC, uh, uh, the band structure in real space now, for only a small distribution of of electrons. So essentially, what you're creating is uh, what's called a wave packet here, and, and all that. I mean, I'm, I'm not get, getting into all the details. It's kind of uh, uh, doing that. So so uh, and and uh, uh, with this. Being the perfect crystal Hamiltonian, and you can write that uh, is is equal to E C of R, and this is with the wave function in real space for the electrons in a perfect crystal, and this is your kind of the new Hamiltonian, and the energy is just that. Does that make sense or not? I mean, that, that's really what we're saying. What we are saying is basically we have already found the 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 eigenvalues in, and as a function of k space. And, and, and in, in real space, it, it takes this form. It's the new Hamiltonian now. It's not, it doesn't have all the details of the atoms. All of that detail is buried inside here and here. It's all you know, uh, essentially uh, sucked into those two parameters. And, and that's the reason why it's called the effective mass theory. I mean, it takes care of the whole crystal, the effective mass one parameter. right? So, so now what we're saying is we have introduced one more dopant into this crystal. And because of that dopant, there is you know, it's very clear that the nucleus of this dopant is positively charged. This is a positively charged nucleus. And a positively charged nucleus will have a, 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 a Coulomb potential that will look uh, like, uh, you know, a Q over 4 pi epsilon 0, epsilon of the semiconductor, 
that's so epsilon of the semiconductor times r, right? right? Uh, this is the potential, and uh, but this is not the uh, this is the potential uh, of 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 this positively charged nucleus, but an electron. You know what is the energy it feels? It's basically minus q is the electron charge times that, right? So so you get a minus q squared by four pi epsilon r is the extra energy in this crystal because there is an ion sitting here now, not a neutral charge, right? Does that make sense? At, at some point in this, in, in this whole crystal. So essentially what has happened is now you have not the perfect crystal, but you have minus Q squared by 4 pi epsilon s r. This is an extra term now. And your energy has changed, the wave functions have changed, and the question is what are those new things? C prime, let's say, right? is E prime C prime. This is the new equation you have to solve. Right? But you really don't have to solve it because the answer is, is, is something that is done in, you know, uh, so, 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 okay, so what you do is you take this over there, this EC, and you realize on the left side what you're left with is something extremely familiar. Right? This is the, uh, well, okay, and this is basically the dopant potential, right? the Coulomb potential of the dopant. C prime R is equal to E minus E C C prime of R. So, uh, so we are trying to find this quantity. What are the new energies? We are trying to find what are the new wave functions because that will tell you how far is the electron wave function going from that point. And what we realize that this Hamiltonian term here on the left side is exactly the same as a hydrogen atom. Right? It's the exactly same. Uh, problem as the hydrogen atom. Is that clear? I mean, basically, a hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron, right? a positive charge and an electron. It's exactly the same as hydrogen, except for two things. One, the mass is not that of a free electron, it's the effective mass of that band, right, where the electron is going to react. The second is the dielectric constant is not the permittivity of vacuum, it's the dielectric constant of the host crystal, you know, the whole, whole crystal. There are only two differences. Other than that, everything looks exactly the same. Uh, because the differential equation is the same as the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen atom, the solution will have the same form. Just take it, replace electron mass with this, replace dielectric constant with that. You're done, right? So, so, and then when you do that, uh, the energies that you are going to get here are that the dopant energy, uh, the donor, say, activation energy, <coughs> uh, 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 let me write that down. So essentially what we are now saying is uh, it's giving you a level which is just below EC of zero, something like that, and it's, you know, it's giving you the value, or the energy eigenvalue is basically at EC minus, uh, EC of zero minus a certain donor activation energy, and this donor activation energy is the hydrogenic you know, bore and uh, the, the the energy eigenvalue of hydrogen atoms, and essentially, let me write it this write down this way. Uh, that's we know that hydrogen atoms uh, uh, inertia energy is 13.6 over n squared, right? Is the uh, and and the effective mass and the dielectric constant dependencies look like this m star over epsilon semiconductor squared. You know, that's how it looks. These are the dependence on the mass and the. So essentially, you can uh, again make it. Uh, uh, you know, just make it uh, dimensionless. And this is in electron volts. This, so if you replace an atom with, a, you know, substitutional dopant, the, you are going to introduce, because of every phosphorus atom or every silicon atom there that you're doping it n-type, you're going to introduce one state, which is exactly this much energy below the conduction band minima, for example. One state, right? And you see there's not just one state, n is an integer, so you'll get n is equal to 1 uh, uh, will be, you know, the deepest state, n is equal to 2 would be here, 3, 4, and then it'll merge into the continuum. So the analogy is the electron state that is tied to the donor, uh, let me also uh, write down, so correspondingly there'll be a certain radius, you know, and that, that, that thing would be called, you know, an effective Bohr radius, if you might, and, and, and that is, uh, 
Uh, I think the Bohr radius of hydrogen atom is what? Like roughly 0.5 angstrom. I think it's probably a little less than that. I forget. But, uh, and, and then uh, uh, what you'll get here is, is you'll get a epsilon s over m star. That's, that's what you're going to get here. The Bohr, effective Bohr radius is the Bohr radius of the hydrogen atom times a ratio like that. Right? And now you can start looking, and let's look at the situation where n is equal to 1 for, for now. Right? I mean, the, the deepest level where that's where the electrons will really be. Uh, uh, and then a typical effective mass of a semiconductor, uh, you know, lo looking at gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, let's say 0.1 for, for argument's sake. And the typical dielectric constant is 10, right? Relative dielectric constant. So you get a 0.1 in the numerator and 100 in the denominator. So you get a 1 over 1,000, right? So everything that is in EV becomes a milli EV now, milli electron volt, right? Therefore, the donor activation energy is of the order of 10 MeV. Make sense? Of the order uh, of 10 MeV. And, uh, oh, I think I'm running out of time now. So, uh, yeah, that, that's the, that's the uh, order of magnitude of a donor activation energy. and and. Uh, uh, the Bohr radius correspondingly will be, you know, so this is 10, this is 0.1, so that's about 100 times, uh, you know, 0.5 angstrom. So it's about, uh, so go that way, about 5 to 10 nanometers. You know. Could be larger, all depends on what masses and dielectric constants you choose. But 5 to 10 nanometers means that this electron is actually hovering around, it's, it's still lightly bound to this, but it's hovering around, and it's sampling a lot of the crystal not just one lattice constant. You know. So the electron is really complete, you know, delocalized in some sense. You had a question? <laughs> yeah, so it's delocalized uh, and, and uh, 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 okay. So now if this is the energy uh, depth and there's an extra electron and at zero Kelvin it's going to just sit here. Right. It's not going to be in the band. But at room temperature we know that KT is of the order of 26 milli electron volts. So just because of the lattice, you know, the jiggling around the atoms and the vibrations, every, uh, you know, this electron will get kicked around with 26 MeV of energy every now and then. I mean, like 10 to about 12 times every second. That's the frequency of vibrations. So it's very clear that it will end up not being here anymore. It's going to, you know, get up somewhere there. And once it gets up in the band, it can move around. It's delocalizing the entire crystal. And that's, you got your n-type dopant. You know, that's the end. So you have introduced carriers into the band now. It's not stuck to the dopant. And, and uh, it's mobile, right? And, and you have an n-type dopant now. So that's the effective mass, a shallow dopant picture of, of doping. If the dopant is very deep, for example, right? uh, uh, if the do uh, so say I'm going to talk in circles a little bit. So if the dopant is very deep, then you can't really apply this theory. I mean, for to start with, so you have to go back to that thing I talked about earlier, where you apply either first principles or some sort of a uh, uh, you know solve a matrix problem there. But if it's very deep, still, if you have introduced silicon atoms, uh, it has an extra electron. But now you see the electron cannot really get out with room temperature, get get into the band at room temperature. So it'll get stuck there, uh, and it it can become that way. It will be a neutral impurity. Does that make sense? I mean, it won't be charged. If the electron is sitting on that, it's neutral, but it's not really charged. And it's, uh, when you actually do the deep level, you'll see the effective external wave function is very small. It's really localized, very small region around it. It doesn't go very far. Uh, and, 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 uh, but every now and then, there's always a probability that it can get kicked out. Right? I mean, there's always a finite probability that it can get kicked out. And, uh, uh, and then the, the time, it takes, so there, basically uh, there is an attempt it makes because of lattice vibrations. You know, it's getting kicked around. It's kind of trying to climb a very high, tall wall. And every second it's trying, you know, about 10 to about 12 times because that's the vibration frequency of lattice. Every second it's trying that uh, to climb the wall, uh, making an attempt, uh, uh, but, but the energy barrier is high. And the idea is, uh, there is a finite probability that it will be ionized. It will take it much longer. That's, that, that's the way to look at it. Right? And, and that time it takes is called the trapping time. The time, uh, it, it could be, uh, you know, uh, it could be milliseconds, it could be seconds, it could be years, or 100 years, it depends. Right? So, so 
uh, so so that that uh, so you can have some sort of defects that would be very fast, some sorts which would be, so this is a recombination, so this is a deep trap, you know, the electron get trapped and then it can get out here. So essentially it's, you know, just like getting, you know, you can reduce the, uh, the current flow in a highway if you get pulled over, right? You, so, right, so that's the same thing, it's the same deal, you basically get trapped, but then you get released later, you know, so, so it's, you know, that's the way to uh, think of, so about a deep trap. Uh, and uh, Okay, so that that's that. I, I, I uh, um, but at least you know, having this in mind, you might think that, well, I'm looking at this, and it's pretty clear that, you know, the dielectric constants of most semiconductors and effective masses are reasonably close to each other, not very different. But how come that the dopant levels energies are so different, right? Because this theory is saying that, or if I re replace, uh, he here's a probably a good better example. Oh yeah, here's the picture. So if you're uh, replacing, uh, uh, in, in, if you're doping silicon, I think I erased that. If you're doping silicon for n-type, uh, 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 for n-type sil uh, silicon, you dope it with phosphorus or arsenic or antimony. You know, these are all group five elements, right? So it should be one extra electron. And it should be n-type. And the energies, you see this theory is agnostic to what atom you chose, right? I mean, it really doesn't care. It just said, well, I have a Coulomb potential. Of, that's nothing to do with what nature of the atom I put in. So what it, this theory says is that your, your activation energy, your ionization energy should be independent of what atom you choose. Right? And what you see is actually reasonably correct for n-type dopants. Reasonably correct. Right? It's, it's almost independent of what atoms you're choosing. But it's very different for p-type dopants. If you, if you choose silicon and you're doping it with boron for p-type, or aluminum for p-type, or gallium, is very different. And we see it's scaling with the radius of the atom. So that essentially points towards the fact that there is another parameter that we have not considered in this picture. You know? And the fact that there is, there'll be, if the atom is too big, it's going to strain the crystal around it now. Right? As an example, as an example. I mean, there are many other effects. There's chemical, you know, nuclear potentials and all that. But in a very simple intuitive example is if the covalent radius of this atom is large, you know, if you're looking at indium, it's a large atom, so so it it, it may not fit nicely in the in the in the crystal. So so that that term must now be added to this Coulomb potential because strain and other things will add another energy term here, right? And that will start shifting things again, right? So uh, so so uh, and, and and the reason this happens uh, for for p-type more is also got to do with the fact that p-type, uh, as you know, the valence band. Uh, states have typically come from p-type -like, p orbitals, p-like orbitals. You have done assignment problems on that, right? Uh, conduction band states have come from s-like orbitals, right? Uh, now, p-type, p-like orbitals are much more uh, directional and localized in some sense com compared to the s-like orbitals, and therefore it sees a lot more detail, a lot more detail of what atom you put in you know, compared to the s orbital, which is like a very blurry vision. It doesn't see all the details; it's delocalized. So that's that's another intuitive reason why you know, the P states or the valence band states get affected this way and not the conduction band states. And so. so for example, uh, uh, you know, for doping, therefore, you want to choose also the atoms that are, uh, I think, the periodic table over there. Uh, so the atoms, uh, if you look at the, you know, le let's say you're doping gallium arsenide, you know, germanium would be a nice choice for n-type. For example, if it goes n-type, if it goes to the gallium site. If it goes into the arsenic site, it would be p-type. But energetically, it, it prefers to go to the gallium site. And we'll talk about the energetics. I think I was planning to do a little bit today, but probably next time. Uh, similarly, gallium nitride, you know, gallium is here, nitrogen is there, and it, silicon is what is being used today. But germanium is also pretty good, pretty good. But if you're growing gallium, uh, uh, you know, similarly, I mean, you choose atoms that are not too far off here, you know, not, not in a very different row, because that atom is much different in covalent radii and may not fit nicely. So. Uh, because of strain and other other aspects of it, so so one can kind of start looking at some of the details uh, of various materials. You know, germanium. You have all these dopants. You can have boron, aluminum, gallium. These are all p-type dopants. Indium, group three. So their levels are very close to the valence band. This is the energy level now. Right? And similarly, you go to the uh, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony. They are all close to the conduction band. These are n-type dopants. These are p-type dopants. Good ones. And the char charges shown here are zero minus. What does that mean? It means that if it is unionized, 
it's zero. And if it's ionized, it's negative. And that's accepted open to N A minus, right? Similarly, you have zero plus, right? But what you notice, you can also have other star states. You can have zero, uh, you can have two minus and three minus. That means each dopant or each site here can be doubly ionized. It can have two electrons, capture two electrons, or release two electrons. It can do that too. Or three. You can have some, uh, you know, three minus states and all that. You can have those two. Or you can have, uh, essentially, there are some which are neutral and so on. So, so you can have charged states or neutral states. So there are two, two aspects of the story which I'm trying to emphasize now. There is one which is what is the energy? And the second is what is the charge on that? Both are very important. Now. So that's for germanium, then you have silicon, and then you have gallium arsenide. You know, gallium arsenide, we were just talking about it. You know, beryllium uh, uh, and carbon. Uh, uh, carbon actually uh, in, in, in gallium arsenide happens to be a p-type dopant. It's, it goes to the arsenic side. So it's here. And, and all of these are negative, so all these are potential uh, p-type dopants for, for uh, beryllium. Is, I mean, both beryllium carbon, they're both used for uh, growth of p-type layers in gallium arsenide. And uh, n-type, you know, uh, so you see silicon occurs in two ways. One is uh, uh, here, the other is there. This one is dopant, is positively charged, so this is a donor, and so on. Okay, so, uh, and then you have all these deeper levels. Uh, chromium is a rather deep level here, for example, right? And it can have a couple of charged states, either zero minus, uh, minus or plus, and so on. Uh, uh, now, uh, the next uh, thing I wanted to... So, and, and so on for gallium nitride and all that. Okay. So, so there is a rich variety. Uh, so first principles calculations uh, using uh, you know, DFT approaches are getting reasonably good at predicting these now. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think you, uh, you know, once you create a chart like this, you can obviously choose what you want for your applications. And then what I was trying to say is the ones on the top here and the ones on the bottom here are your N and P dopants, very, very useful. But these are also useful. There are devices where you can actually use them to create nice effect. You know. Terahertz detectors, if you have a deep level, it gets, if you put a carrier here, it gets sucked out very, very fast, really fast. And then that can, you know, basically just a spatial acceleration of the charge uh, in, this, in the semiconductor can uh, help you create or generate terahertz signals. You know. This is kind of very interesting. So, so there are uh, many other things. And then uh, if you have a deep level, uh, and you are uh, uh, so. So essentially, what I was trying to say is, it gets trapped. It gets trapped or uh, pulled out of the band very fast, but then it sits there for a long time, right? Uh, and uh, similarly, you can have uh, states that are uh, recombination centers that can go either positive or negative. We already saw that, right? There are some states we can zero minus or zero plus, like chromium in gallium arsenide, for example, right? And then let's say you want to make a device where. Uh, you, 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 have a, uh, you want to get rid of electrons and holes very, very fast. There are many situations where it's so actually one of the great examples is a pacemaker, you know, in the heart, the, the, the hearts, uh, trans, I mean, the pacemakers used for the heart, where you have, you need very low power. So essentially you introduce recombination centers there intentionally, such that, uh, you know, in a PN diode, you cannot switch it faster than the minority carrier lifetime, unless, introduce this, then it really speeds it up very fast. But then there are other penalties you play, it, it increases your leakage current and other things. But so there are applications where you need it to be fast and you don't care about the leakage current. So that, that's really what I'm trying to say. Uh, so you can choose the proper defects, uh, substitution defects to do the job that you need. So. Okay, so I will just uh, very briefly uh, uh, mention, uh, and then this is something, by the way, we have a Make a class tomorrow. I think you have that in your calendar. I hope, right? Tomorrow, 6 p.m. I think it's here. I'll send out an email reminder. Uh, but uh, I will approach this uh, next topic. Uh, uh, it's better to do it in the next class, in the make a class tomorrow. Uh, but uh, what I want to say is now that you have energy levels and the charge states of these, and what I want to say is everything that we talked about earlier, which is intrinsic has the same deal. If you have a interstitial or a vacancy, they'll have states either in the gap or, uh, and they'll have some charge states. So a vacancy state could be in the gap and it could uh, uh, be here maybe and it can accept a negative charge as possible. So, so, and then our, our vacancy could be a donor-like state it can, or acceptor-like state, a deep level. Right? 
And what we'll do next is say that yes, I've created, you know, for each of these vacancies and dopants, I've created this chart, right? And I know it can be negative charge, positive charge, and all that. Now can you tell me that, let's say I have doped this material, uh, uh, you know, with uh, uh, 10 to the power of 17 donors, and I have, you know, maybe 10 to the power, uh, uh, what we'll see next is just the fact that you are doping a material can change whether a vacancy can form or not. And that's very, very weird, but it's actually true. It's vacancy, formation of a vacancy depends on whether you're doping the material or not. And that's a very interesting point. And what, that's something that actually forbids you typically in, in growth sometimes to be able to dope beyond a certain level. Because you dope a little more and you create even more dope vacancies or interstitials. And you know, it takes away all the carriers that you're introducing. And that part of it is an energetic argument. And it goes very similar to the, all the arguments you have talked about earlier about spin order decomposition. It will be a competition between a formation energy and the entropy. And we'll see that the, when you combine the two, you can explain uh, that as you change, you know, as you dope a material, what you do is you're moving the Fermi level, right, with exceptional dopants. And we see as you move the Fermi level, some vacancies become very less possible and other vacancies become very highly possible now, and so on. So, so there is another plot to this, which is the vacancy levels now. Right? And if your carrier densities that you are looking at in the top, if the vacancies start overpowering this, if the vacancies are here, then you don't see anything that, I mean, the doping is not doing anything for you. It's all defect related. If the vacancies are lower, you know, down here, then, then you start seeing the actual dopant effect and conductivity effects. So that aspect we will uh, discuss uh, uh, tomorrow. And, and that's really the major uh, thing. And it has led to a very interesting observation these days. Uh, for example, as an example, if you don't dope material at all, but you have a hydrogen interstitial, interstitial hydrogen. Hydrogen gets in, it's interstitial. Uh, and you calculate where is the energy of the hydrogen interstitial for you know, a lot of semiconductors, compounds, semiconductors, silicon, germanium. I mean, what, what, uh, this is paper I started out with uh, also in the course about band offsets uh, from 2003. These are, these are new results. I mean, not, these are not 100-year-old physics. I mean, these are people are still figuring out these things now. You know? Uh, so, so yeah, hydrogen interstitial energy for all semiconductors is, you know, for example, silicon carbide is there, aluminum nitride is there, gallium nitride is there. This is calculation, you know, DFT sort of calculation. And then they put all of them together and they see that, you know, if you plot, the, if you keep the hydrogen interstitial energy constant for all, and you will now have the band offsets that will correspond to things. And these band offsets that you get because of a uniform hydrogen interstitial potential energy, is exactly equal or is very close to what people have measured as the band offsets between two different materials. So, you know, there's the thought now is that the band offset may be actually being controlled by defects, right? So, so that's kind of very interesting as well. This is something which we thought was more fundamental. Maybe, maybe it's linked to hydrogen levels uh, and hydrogen is one of the most notoriously difficult material to control because it's so light, it gets in every, you cannot stop it from diffusing in into the, into the crystal. It's hard to, you know, control. Uh, and, and it may be one of the reasons why the band offsets are the way they are. It's still an evolving story right now. So, uh, and, and, and so on. And we'll talk about this aspect and, and the energetics of, of, of oh, you know, uh, the, the, the charge states and the energy states of the hydrogen atoms in the next class. So, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. <clears throat>